rest. One, two, three. Is it? Okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll continue on. There we go. Um, so, uh, so tonight we start our evening service starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, Pastor Jerry will be doing the adults in the chapel. Uh, Jonathan is going to be taking the teens, uh, so middle school and teenagers will be going upstairs in the teen room there, uh, and so he'll be doing that. And then uh, I talked to Karen, uh, really didn't get a firm answer, but uh, her and I will be uh, doing the children's downstairs. I, I just don't want I, I want, I want Jackie and Carolyn and Jenny to be able to come up and fellowship with the adults, so... I don't want them to do, to do the children as well. So Karen and I are now going to step in and do that until somebody else wants to come in other than Jackie, Carolyn, Jenny, or Tabitha, okay? And so we're looking for, pray for a, a children's leader to come in to help the children. And so, but we'll be starting that tonight. And then Wednesday evening services will start at 6.30. So tonight it goes from 6 to 7, one hour, and then... Um, uh, Wednesday night will be from 6.30 to 7.30, one hour. And so uh, just come to that and have a sweet time of fellowship and prayer as well. And then next Sunday, we have our annual business meeting. So we'll have church as regular, Sunday school as regular. And then after that, we'll be heading downstairs having a dinner. And then after the dinner, we'll be having our annual uh, business meeting, going over our uh, uh, budget that we've put together, and uh, and then talking about some things, some business in the church, and so um, you're more than welcome to come to that. That's all I have for announcements at this time. Um, when does ladies Bible study? Okay, ladies Bible study will be starting in February, and then my, men's men's prayer breakfast will be starting up here as well um, in February. Um, that one we'll be doing every other Saturday. Um, so, so some things happening, and that will be starting up. And so let's turn to God in prayer. Is there any prayer requests that we want to make mention of? Um, how, how are Mark and Susie doing, Pastor, or uh, Tony, with covid Okay, good. Oh, Amy's, yeah, she's got hit with the tiredness of it. Okay. All right. Oh, really? As far as tired or his lungs or all of it? Okay. Which, being a plumber, you can't be too exhausted if you want to get paid. So we'll be praying. Okay. Right. So we'll be praying for Mark, Susie, Tony, and Amy. And Pastor and Jackie as well. Good. Sue. Our country is so much help. Yeah. Yeah, for our country, for our leaders, for our citizens. Yeah, it's it's crazy times that we live in. I Growing up in high school, in elementary, I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is all third world country stuff, you know. Man, it's right here in the United States. This is what movies have been made of, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I laugh, I smile. But, uh, uh, there, yep, Satan is alive and well and working in humanity today. Yep, so we'll be praying for our nation Pray for citizens that are Christian, citizens that have dual citizenship, right? We're, we're Americans that, as well as other Christians of different nationalities. But our, this, this world is not our home, right? Now, now, don't say I'm giving up and saying let's just lay over and die here to go to heaven. No, but, but this is all temporal here. And, and as we read and study scripture, it, it's getting worse. It's got to get worse, you know, as, as the Lord uh, prepares for his return. I've been praying that our nation would be um, a sheep nation, not so much the nation. Okay, I understand. It's the people. 
that the people would be sheep, that our leaders would be sheep. And by that I mean Christians. And so we'll see what God does here. Maybe he's working. Maybe as I think about this and I ponder about this, maybe as we're reading the book of Isaiah and we see how God is bringing out punishment upon the Israelites for their idolatry and their passivity in, in walking with God, maybe he's doing the same thing to the Christian church in the United States. I don't know. But, the, but we all know we definitely need a wake-up call as Christians because we have been leisurely, complacently relishing our, our liberties here in the United States while Satan has been actively working behind the scenes, undermining... Um, the church and our and our voice, and so, uh, yeah, our, our nation needs prayer. Our our uh, Christians need prayer. Uh, we need a revival, and and I'm praying that through this whole event that's always going on here, and it seems to be getting worse, that Christ would just be proclaimed among His children, and that there would be a revival in the United States. But yeah, our our nation needs. Definite prayer. Thanks, Sue. So that's one sermon. Now let's go on for uh, some more prayer requests here. Any, any other prayer requests? My mom. Uh, she was sick. I got a call. No. When, when did I tell you? Did I tell you guys my mom was sick with the flu kind of thing? I, I can't. That was Monday. Then I got the call. And then... Um, then I called on Wednesday. No, they called me Wednesday, said, hey, uh, Laurel said, hey, there's somebody that has, uh, one of the residents has COVID. I said, okay. And so they're going to test everybody. I said, so how's my mom doing? Because she had the flu. And they said, hey, she's up. She's eating breakfast. She's back to her, she's getting back to her normal self because my mom's a jokester. She has dementia. But that joking side of her has still been there. I mean, she'll just say the funniest things. And, uh, and so they said, yeah, she's doing good. I get a call, not even 10 minutes later, hey, your mom tested positive for COVID. They're moving her to uh, uh, a quarantine section. And I said, I thought she was doing better. They said, well, it seems like she's asymptomatic. So just pray for my mom. Um, I'll, I'll be checking in regularly, seeing how she's doing. But, but yeah, 80, 86 years old, and um, no, 87 years old, 87 years old, 87 years young. All right, anybody else? Krista is doing well in Louisiana. She stepped on a nail, um, but it doesn't sound like it's terrible. Uh, she's, they got her working there because of the, the two hurricanes that went through. She's, they have her demolishing, just kind of, she's a project engineer. But she's got to learn how to do this, project manager. Yeah. And so she's got to learn how to do the job and what's expected. So just pray for her that she stays safe. Uh, she showed me one house that the roof is kind of propped up with the board that's hanging over. I said, I wouldn't be walking underneath that roof. So just pray for her safety, you know, or just... Uh, wisdom on where to walk, what to step under, but she's doing well there, and it sounds like she's got an apartment um, that she can move to, because one couple that is a part of there, they're moving out, nobody's behind them, so she is possibly able to step into that apartment, so just pray for her. Anybody else? We're praying for Deb Fickert with her leg and that nerve problem there. And the Statler family as well. Anybody else? I'm thankful for technology. I'm, I'm thankful for uh, Christian news people. Um, you don't know who to trust anymore, right? And, uh, and I, I kind of jokingly say like uh, uh, Jameson off of... Uh, Spider-Man, I trust my barber. Uh, Karen's my barber. I trust her. But, but you don't know who to trust anymore. But, but hopefully the Christian media, we, we can trust them and stay abreast of what's going on and what's occurring. 
So I, I thank you. I thank the Lord for them, and we need to pray for, again, our nation and, and discernment among the, the children of God. Anybody else? Yeah. And I don't and, know what the answer is. Yeah, and they're they're private, so they, they can do that legally. But uh but yeah, so um but we have to be smart in how we get the word out. There's we're finding other ways that are popping up as well to, to proclaim Christ. And so I think I'm thanking God for Mitch and the opportunity we have to to broadcast live here. And, and even that it can go out over the internet as well. And so uh, we need to be uh, harmless as doves and wise as serpents, right? So, and we're, we're not fearful. Uh, I hope we're not fearful. Anybody else? All right, well, let's turn to God in prayer. God, it is so good to be in your house today. And, and <clears throat> we still have a lot of people who who don't want to attend because of COVID here. But we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that they can watch live. And we pray for them. We pray for their safety and their protection and the, their well-being, as well as ours, Lord. And, and we thank you, God, that you've allowed us to be able to meet together as a church and as a family. And, and Lord, <clears throat> our whole desire, Lord, is to reflect Jesus Christ. And, and as we look at at the scriptures, um, especially the New Testament, when, when Christianity was, uh, the church was being started there and the Christianity was growing and, and persecution occurred and, and, and the Christians were being um, pressed and squeezed and, and it caused them to move and it caused them to be, uh, uh, to, to give words of hope in Jesus Christ and the church flourished. Lord, I pray that that would be happening today with your children here in the United States, Lord. As, as some hard things are happening, we, we listen to what's going on in, in, the, in, in, the, in the Congress, Lord, with some of the, the, the rights that are being um, switched around and changed. And, and uh, you know, our, our Christian liberties could be um, squelched. But, Lord, nowhere in, in Scripture do I see that a nation is mandated to give Christian liberties as far as um, we, we've come to expect that, God. And a nation is walking with you expects that as well. But we know that the prince and power of the air, Satan himself, is, is doing everything he can to undermine uh, the voice of your children and your church. But you said the gates of hell will not prevail, Lord, that you hold the keys to, to death and Hades and, and to life and to heaven, really, and, and you are victorious. And so we know as Christians we are on the winning side. But, but we also know because you said that the world has hated you, they're going to hate us also. And so, Lord, help us to understand that, that this is um, a byproduct of, of a sinful condition that we find ourselves in. Um, Lord, so we do pray for the United States. We, we, we listen to the soldiers, the men and women who have who fought in, in battles for our freedom, for our liberties. And, and we listen to them as, as they are um, hurt and disappointed and even disgusted with, with the way they, they... And they... It's, it's not the, the, the nation that they fought for when they fought. And, and, uh, but we thank you for them. And Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for love. We, we pray for tenacity as your children that we would not cower uh, in, our, in our walk with you and 
in proclaiming the truths of Jesus Christ, God. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray, God, because we know that as, as you control the rivers, the way they flow through the, throughout the lands, throughout this world, so you also, the psalmist says, controls the king's heart. And so, God, you're the one who's behind the king's heart. Even if they are wicked, uh, you can control them, Lord, and you are controlling them. And you are sovereign. And, 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 and here we are, find ourselves under your, uh, your rule, under your authority, under your sovereignty. And, and we submit ourselves to you. But that doesn't cause us again, Lord, to, to uh, have a, a complacent heart. Or attitude, because we are held accountable for our will, for the choices that we make. And so, Lord, help us to be making the choices that align with you and your word. And the only way that we know that, God, is by spending time with you in your word, studying it, going deeper into your word, learning more about you and how your word applies to us, and then spending time in conversing with you. So use these times, God, these seemingly dark times in a nation that is, is seemingly being divided more and more, God, between the people and the government. And, and, uh, and, but, but again, God, you are in control, and so we are at peace. But we pray for this nation. We pray because we want our children to have freedom and to have liberties. And so we ask, God, that you would just work uh, through us and in us, that there might be a revival in the United States. That there might be truth proclaimed and people would have discernment of right and wrong and truth and lies. Lord, we also just pray for, uh, sounds like Mark and Amy are, are having the worst part of the COVID thing with uh, being tired and, and, um, and, and they need to work. We just ask that you just help them to come through this quickly and well, as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you for helping uh, my mom and, and Susie and Tony to um, be somewhat resilient to this. But we just ask you to help them to come through it well and that they'd be healed of this. And, and Lord, for our, our strength and our well-being and our health, God, it, it all comes from you. And, and so we thank you for it and we ask that you would just continue to protect us and keep us healthy and strong. Lord, we, we thank you for things that wake us up. And, uh, and God, we also just thank you for Carissa and the job that you've given to her and the, the place where she's at and the training that she's receiving. Lord, help her to uh, find and be in favor of her employer and, 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 and the peers that she works with and, and for this apartment to open up. Lord, we, we're starting up church tonight, evening service and youth group and Wednesday night service. And, and Lord, may you just uh, use us, God, to, to train one another, to equip one another, to live in a world that um, needs to see hope, needs to have hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. And so, God, we come together to encourage one another. God, we, we come together to prepare for battle, Lord, this... this uh, this, sometimes we think the church is a cruise ship, but God, it's a battleship as we are preparing for battle when we go outside these walls. Uh, because life is a battle and our enemy is Satan. And so God, help us to be equipped here in this church uh, to grow, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to keep on keeping on as we walk day by day as you give us life. Lord, I, I pray for the state of family, family, Lord, and and what's going on in their lives uh, with Gary passing away. We, we thank you for his salvation. We also just thank you that uh, you've allowed us to be able to minister to the, the family during this time as a church facility. And Lord, we also just pray for them as they're struggling with other things too. God, may we be able to come and, and be a part of their uh, assistance and help and strength. 
We ask now too, Lord, that you just be pleased to be among us as we raise our voices in praise today. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
seated, but please continue to sing with us.
How is your soul today? Yeah. The times we live in, there, there, is some, there is some aching. Well, hopefully you'll be encouraged today as we look at Isaiah 44. We'll continue on where we left off. And, and um, Let's pray. God, we're, we're getting ready now to ask you to, to speak to us through your word, to uh, comfort the hurting, 
to equip each and every one of us, Lord, to be on guard specifically against idolatry, as we'll be looking at today. And um, no one is exempt. Even your children are not exempt from idolatry. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would have the freedom to move and reveal in our hearts today and in our lives and our mind. Lord, if there is any idolatrous thing, that we would eradicate it through repentance and give our lives, our hearts completely to you, the lover of our soul the redeemer of our lives, the author and finisher of our very lives, and the one who awaits us to come into your presence one day as your children by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so, Lord, we do thank you for that. And so, God, I just ask that you would just use me today. Speak through me. May your spirit work in me, my heart, my lips, my mind. Uh, God, that you would be glorified, that you'd be pleased, Lord, with how I, how I um, disperse your word. Lord, thank you for uh, being God who is in total control on your throne. And so in the midst of storms that this life brings... We have every opportunity with the fullest assurance and confidence in you to say, it is well with my soul. And so God, just uh, speak to us now. Accomplish all that you desire to accomplish with us and in us and through us with your word. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we're going. We're in the second part of Isaiah here. Um, it, it, it behooves us to understand as we as we're looking at Isaiah the how Christ is always coming out. Um, we we have to understand that the the Word of God is not two distinct books, the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is one book. It is, is, it is God's word, and we, we cannot understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. And so we have to be in the Old Testament as well. But the thing is, is as we work and weave through the Old Testament and the New Testament as God's students here, as we're reading the word of God, we should see that, that the work of Jesus Christ is woven throughout the scriptures from, from Genesis 1, 1, until Revelation, the very end. And, 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 and in that, we see Jesus Christ. Um, I guess that's Bible, Bible uh, theology right there, biblical theology, right? Uh, not so much, much the, the systematic or historical, it's biblical theology. And, and we're looking at Jesus Christ here, Working and woven throughout the scriptures. And, and in John chapter 5, um, verse 33 there, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who are, saying, who are, who are challenging him and his authority. And, and he says, you, he, Jesus says to them, you guys think you know the scriptures, but, but you don't. Because if you did, you'd see that the scriptures are talking about me. Jesus says that. Or, or in Luke uh, chapter 24, uh, verses 27. Here, let's just read that real quick as we're, we're looking at this. As, and we're building the foundation here. Uh, I'm not, this isn't one of my rabbit trails, but it is a foundation that we're, we're setting up here. But in Luke chapter 24, uh, Jesus is with the, the, the two apostles on the road to Emmaus there, and he's talking with them. And, and in verse 27, he says this, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus, he explained to them 
what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. They didn't have the Old Testament. He's talking all about the, the, new te- the Old Testament there. They didn't have the New, they had the Old, and that's what he's talking about there. And then in verse 44, and he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And so it's all about Jesus. And in and, uh, and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 there, Paul is saying, hey, everything is yes with God's word about Jesus Christ. And so uh, we have to understand that everything in the word of God from Revelation there, chapter 22... It's it's all about Jesus Christ and and the redemptive work of God. And and, um, so we have the the creation, we have uh, the fall, the flood, the redemption, and and ultimately one day what we're waiting for is the consummation, for everything to be fulfilled. But, But as we read the Word of God, we have to see Jesus Christ at work through the Scriptures here. And we see that... In, in Isaiah chapter 44. And last week we talked a little bit about that, where um, he talks about um, his servant Jacob, the Israelites, Israel whom I've chosen. Uh, he, he used the word Jeshurun, uh, the ones that he has made upright. Jesus Christ, God has made them upright uh, through righteousness. And, and, and we'll kind of get into this a little bit more as we work through this. But, but other places in Isaiah, uh, he's mentioned how he's removed their sins. And that he is the Holy One. And so here today, let's start in verse 6 here uh, of chapter 44. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty... I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. And again, this is what Jesus Christ even uh, said of himself there in, in, uh, in Revelation chapter 1 and in Revelation chapter 22. These are words. He's the first, the last. He's Alpha and Omega. And so what he's saying is, is he's getting ready to talk about the children of Israel falling into idolatry and about idols themselves. And he's saying, there's, there's never been a God before me. I have been eternal in the past, and there's not going to be a God after me. It doesn't mean I'm going to somewhat, when he says I'm the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, that eventually I'm just going to stop living. No, he is saying I am eternal in past and in future. I'm here in the present, and there's not going to be a God before me, after me, or even in here during this time. And so God is eternal, he is holy, and, and there is no other God beside him. And, and this is mentioned, these are the very words mentioned of Jesus Christ as well. And then he says, who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people. And what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what is to come. And so here, uh, as we've been going through this chapter here, again, um, as we've been going through the book of Isaiah... The Israelites are, are being ready to be punished, uh, specifically the tribe of Judah here. And, and, and they, are, they are getting ready to be taken into captivity, though at the time of the writing of, of this, it's about 150 years before they're taken into captivity. And, uh, and so at this time, again, uh, just to reiterate here, uh, Isaiah is probably at, at, during the time of Manasseh. Probably one of the, if not the most wicked king in, in Israel's history in, in offering his children to, as sacrifices over the fire to Baal, to Moloch. And, um, and that's, the, that's the time that Isaiah finds himself writing these truths that are going to be happening and, and how the children of Israel are going to be taken into captivity. And, and this writing is to encourage them as they've been in Babylon for their 70-year captivity, uh, over 100 
years after this writing, and they're getting ready to come out, and so he's trying to encourage them, hey, there is a God who is eternal, he is holy, and, and you need to be looking to him, there's nobody like him before him, there won't be anybody like him after him, he is holy, so be on guard, this is how you need to behave, this is how you need to, to guard yourself against such things here, is by remembering these things, and God is saying, there's no one here, let them come and and proclaim it if there is, and there is nobody. And then he says, so do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? What's that? That you're going to be taken into captivity by the Babylonians, and that you're going to be there for 70 years. And then after that 70 year uh, uh, being away from the land, you're going to be able to come back. And he says, you are my witnesses. Is there, is there any God beside me? No. There is no other rock. I know not one. Not one. The, he's, not, he's, saying, he's not saying, I don't, I don't think there's any other one there. He's saying, no, there is not one. This is a, a firm statement. I am the only God. I am the rock. I am the one where you have sure footing, a sure foundation. Though the storms of life come, nations rise, nations fall, but I remain the same God today as I was yesterday and as I will tomorrow and as I will for eternity as well. And so then here, uh, there, there's expectations, okay? Again, God is holy, right? Remember when God was on Mount Sinai there uh, and, and Moses was called up there? And God says, stay away from the mountain here because I'm on this mountain and I'm holy and my holiness transcends to this mountain here because if you touch it, you're going to die. Uh, and not only that, though, is, is the holiness is a part of God, just as his eternality is. And because of his holiness, he is able to make his children holy. Exodus chapter 22. Let me turn there real quick. Exodus 22. In Exodus 20, we have his, uh, him giving the Ten Commandments there. In Exodus 22, verse 31, uh, Moses writes this for us. God says, you are to be my holy people. So do not eat the meat of the, an animal torn by wild beasts, throw it to dogs. The main point there is, is God saying, I'm holy, and I'm calling you now, Israelites, the Hebrew nation here, to be my holy people. I'm going to put my holiness upon you as well. You are to be my holy people. It's expected of them. Turn to Leviticus, just a, a book over. Chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. And let me start in verse... 44, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. And then in chapter 20 of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. Consecrate yourselves, God says, and be holy because I am the Lord your God. And then in verse chapter 21, verse 18, God says, No man uh, who has any defect, uh, nope, that's not the one. I think I wrote it down wrong. Anyway, God, again, is saying, be holy because I am holy. If you see it there, let me know. Um, oh, no. Oh, sorry. Um, he's talking about the priest, chapter 21, verse 8. Regard them as holy because they offer up the food of your God. Consider them holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I who make you holy. And so God here is making the children of Israel holy. Uh, and then chapter 20, just go back just a page. And 
let me start in verse 25. Uh, you must therefore make a distinction between clean and unclean animals and between unclean and unclean and clean burns. Do not defile yourselves by any animal or bird or anything that moves along the ground. Those that I have set apart are as unclean for you. You are to be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. And so God here is saying to the Israelites, I have set you apart. You are to be holy and I have expectations of you to be holy and I'm going to use you as my, as my instruments to be holy. Now, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Starting verse 13, therefore, Peter says this, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to, be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Coming. To the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And then in Revelation Chapter 1. Um, I don't want to read the whole thing. Um, let me just start in the latter part of verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. And, and my point here is, is, is God is, is making his children holy, and his whole purpose is, is that we'd be used by him, serving him, uh, to become the priest that he has made us to be. And, and that's important for us to understand as we look at what's going to happen in, in the book of Isaiah and how we can then apply it to us as well. So let's go back to Isaiah 44. God is holy, um, so far we've learned, and, and he places his holiness upon his children, and he expects us to be holy. Now the Israelites, they forgot that, and God has a problem with this. And now he goes on to say in verse 9, All who make idols are nothing. The things they treasure are worthless. Those who speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Who shapes a god and casts an idol, which can profit nothing? People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen are only human beings. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and shame. This blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes the, an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. And so here we have this carpenter making this idol that can't even sustain him. The carpenter uh, make, measures with a line and makes an outline with the marker. He roughs it out with the chisels and marks it with the compasses. He shapes it into a, a human form, human form in all its glory that it may dwell in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or perhaps takes, took a cypress or oak. He, he let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. It is used for fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself, and he kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire, over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats its fill. his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I see the fire. From the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my God. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds are closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, Half of it I used for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes as a deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, 
Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? And so God is, is just saying here, look, listen to the absurdity. Listen to how ridiculous this is, the things that you're doing here. It, it makes no sense at all. You, you lack understanding. There was a story of this um, little boy. His dad had a, a room full of idols that he had made in, in this other country. And uh, the dad's away at work, so the son grabs a big old stick, and he goes through and he smashes every single idol except for the biggest idol. And after he smashed all the, the idols that were in that room, he puts the stick in the big idol's hand. And, and he leaves. His dad comes home and sees this, this mayhem in the room with all these little idols destroyed and the big idol holding the stick. And he calls his son in here and he says, you did this. And I'm going to take this stick to death with it. And the son gently says, you're going to beat me death to death with a stick that a little weak boy when he broke all these idols, that a big idol couldn't stop. And the dad stopped and thought about that and realized that this idol is nothing. It is nothing. I, I wrote this down as I was preparing this message, so forgive me, i got to read it, though. Um, it says, I said, uh, The farther we move from God the more skewed our thinking becomes. Um, the reason I, what, was, what I was thinking through here is, is it's been hundreds of years that the Israelites have, when, when, a, when Abraham was called by God and he chose them to create a nation through Abraham and, and then Isaac and then Jacob and then the 12 tribes and, and they have went into Egypt and, and now... After that time, they've come out, and now they're in the land, and now they've set up kings, and, and, and now Manasseh is king, and there's only going to be a half a dozen or so more kings before Babylon comes and, and takes them over. Um, but but those, those hundreds of years, when, when they first were following God, they have now fallen away. And I, I was thinking about the United States, you know, and, and where we're at today. And, and I, I fully understand where Sue is at and their thinking here. Because back when, the, when our founding fathers came or the, the pilgrims came and, and they came to, um, for freedom of religion there as well and, and, and how they were based upon everything that they did, their laws were based upon God and, and, uh, and, and they were, it was a nation founded under God. But I said, the farther we move from God, the more skewed our thinking becomes. And that's where we're at today. Our perception of God determines our level of worship for Him or our level of worship for idols. The more, the more that we are drawn to God, the more that we worship Him. The farther we move from God, the more we're susceptible to worshiping other things apart from or, or along with God. And then this brings about a prevailing thought that becomes... I will not entrust my well-being to some cosmic God or thing who doesn't give a rip about me. Is that where many Americans are at today? That's what I kind of think. That's, that's my opinion here. I'm giving you my opinion on this. But, and I, I, I guess it's more than just an opinion. It, it's, you can read about the, the things that are being said through uh, uh, where people are at. This then brings about our soul dependence upon self and a rejection of God. And we have that humanism at work in, in, in not only the United States, but the world today. Humanistic thinking. Um, and that's, that's the prevailing thought that is out there. But my, my biggest concern along with that is, is we've integrated that in among the Christian circle. And so what has happened now is we've become codependents upon God and self. And when we become codependent upon anything or anyone other than God alone, by definition, that now has become an idol. Which means Christians are involved in idolatry.
I always say to my kids and, and to myself, uh, do your best and let God do the rest. And you might think, well, isn't that self-sufficiency? Aren't you saying, you know, satisfy self first and then what you can't do, then let God do? No, I, I say that under the premise of this. God does not expect me to be a spoiled little brat who just sits on the sidelines and says, God, take care of it all. Because, again, God has called us, called, called me, called my children to be holy and actively serving him. And so to actively serve him means I am doing my best. I am giving him my best. But my best is limited in what I can do. So he then has to step in and do the rest. And so that, that whole thinking there, do your best and let God do the rest, is not a, is not a codependency of like, I, I don't trust God to do it all, so I'm going to do what I can do. And then he'll take care of it maybe. No, it is God expects me to do my best, and he will come alongside of me and do the rest. So when I say that, say that it's not that I am codependent upon myself in place of what God can't maybe do for me, or I think I can do better. Augustine said this about idolatry. Idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshipped. Here we have God talking to the Israelites here about the foolishness of idolatry. And again, remember, uh, uh, God's holiness, God's eternality, God never changes. He's the same yesterday as he was today and will be tomorrow. And so he expects the same thing of his children who he's called and placed his holiness upon as well. And he's made us priests today. And um, the second commandment of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not make any graven image. Well, I think we Christians are pretty much good with that. I, I can go to your house and I don't think you need to be wa walking around thinking, have I put my little Buddha statue away or my little whatever statue away? You know, we, we, Christians, we, we don't, we're, we're good with that. But it's the first commandment that we have to be on guard. Thou shalt have no other God besides me. There was this, um, this story. Um, it was in Africa. And, and this village had this shrine to their gods. And and. It was, a, it, was a, it was a house, a well-kept house that had beautiful walls with various sticks and poles coming out and then poles all along the top of the roof. And they would feed their gods live birds and animals. Their gods were snakes. And, and they, they worship these snakes. The, if, if the snake wanted to get down and go into town and the people saw it on the road, they would step by alongside it and beg for their God to let them pass by. And, um, and one time uh, at the place of worship there, uh, this lady heard her little baby crying and a little toddler and she goes into the room and there is a a boa constrictor who has her child. And all she could do was beg that her God would kill the baby before it ate it. And, and we're appalled by that. Like what in the world? What kind of mother would do such a thing? That would give up their child to a fake God. This is where we Christians have to be on guard. Are we giving up our children to the God of leisure? Are we saying, 
church is not important, so we're not going to go today. We're just going to stay home and have fun. Because I want to be a good dad and show you what it is to have fun. Are we saying, are we showing our children that, you know what? It's more important to me to climb the company ladder to get more money to buy stuff that we can have fun. As opposed to, kids, there's a God who has equipped us to work so that we might be able to live this life the way that he expects us to live. And he's blessed us with this job. He's blessed us with this money. Let's just take time to thank him. And we, and we find ways to share God. But we, we, I'm finding Christians more and more in the United States caught up in the idolatrous desire of monetary fun things. Whether it's wealth, whether it's great vacations, and I'm not saying in and of themselves they're not they're not wrong. Decide to do these things, and our kids are learning less and less about God. Isn't that definition then an idol? Because we are seeking that more than God Himself. But I sure praise God for this. He says in verse 20, Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you, you are my servant. And we can go, and this corresponds in the book of, all through the New Testament as well. We see that God has made us his servant, that we are chosen by God, that we have been forgiven by God. In verse 22, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud. I have wiped your slate clean. Your sins are gone. I'm, pa- I'm, I'm casting them as far as the east is from the west, and I will not hold you accountable to those any longer. Praise God for that. I'm not going to be held accountable uh, for my idolatrous things that I might allow to creep into my life. But that shouldn't be something that just says, well, then go ahead and live on the way you're living so that God's grace might abound more. Who's that sound like? Paul, right? Romans. Should I sin so that God's grace would abound more? God forbid, no, that we would do such a thing. We are God's chosen. We are forgiven. We are, he says, return to me for I have redeemed you. And then what happens? Sing for joy. You heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests, and all your trees. For the land has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. I um, I love uh, the Word of God and reading it and and uh, and. I remember telling you guys, remember when I was telling you we had these two, um, uh, two evangelists, they were uh, um, Nazis, former Nazis. Uh, they, came, they were evangelists there in the United States. They came to our church. And, uh, and I remember talking to the one evangelist there, the brother in Christ, I can say that. And he, and he, he talked to me about when Jesus Christ went and, and got that lamb, right? Uh, the the one the one hundredth lamb that walked away and and he, and he talked about well and, and actually it was in in light of um, when the woman found her lost coin there and and it's the idea of when when somebody repents of their sin there is rejoicing in heaven and, and God delights when we repent when we repent of sin and there's rejoicing that occurs you know and and um, and so as we think about this, this idea of, of is there sin in our camp, is there idolatry in our hearts, we have to be coming to Jesus Christ and allowing him to, to reveal that to us. John Calvin says this, No man can take a survey of himself, but he must immediately turn to the contemplation of God in whom he lives and moves. And I wrote down, knowledge of ourselves needs to be woven in with the knowledge of God. God's redemption removes his condemnation, and our repentance brings heavenly praise. Luke 15, 10. 
God is the one who makes us upright. God is the one who has called us to serve him as his holy priests. Oh, that we'd be on guard. Um, let me just close on how easy it is to, to fall into idolatry and worship something or somebody else. Remember John? And he's in heaven, right? And, and he's, being, he's being shown the end times, what's going to happen. And at the very end of the book there, in John chapter 21, after, after the angel reveals all these things to John, what does John do? He falls down and starts to worship the angel. And you're like, oh my word, John, you know Jesus Christ. You see who he is, and now you've fallen down right then and there. You see how easy. Be on guard. The angel says, hey, get up, don't worship me, worship God, right? Worship the Lamb. We have to be on guard. And today, that's my challenge to you, is allow the Holy Holy Spirit to life, and as you, he reveals things, to weave himself in your heart in such a way that you eradicate all the idols of the heart. All these things are either making you codependent upon God and something else, to where you are completely sold out, dependent upon the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of our soul, Jesus Christ. And then you will be at peace, no matter what comes your way, because you know that the ruler of your life is in not only total control of you and your thoughts, but in life in general. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would just be on guard because the farther we move away from you, the easier it is to allow other things to come in. You didn't create sin, but, but sin occurs when we are drawn away by our own lusts and enticed. And so, Lord, help us to draw near to you, to live for you, completely for you. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would just reveal all the different things that may be on the throne of our heart, God, that you alone should uh, reside on. God, reveal those little idols, those little sins that are drawing us away from you, if there are things like that. Lord, help us to contemplate with you at the source of our contemplation and allow you to reveal what are we holding on to what is drawing our passion? If we have more passion for something else other than you, then that, in fact, is an idol. If there is more love for something else other than you, that is an idol. And so, God, help us not to be idolatrous. I know we're not going to be judged for that as your children, but you've called us to be holy and these kinds of things are what inhibit our ability to proclaim Jesus Christ to a world who desperately today needs hope. And so God, reveal in us the sins, the idols of the heart, so that we might live the life of priesthood that you've called each and every one of us to. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe... Maybe some of you are saying today, you know what? I can think of an idol right now that has come into my life that I need to give to the Lord. Would you pray for me, Pastor Kelly? If there's somebody that would just say, would you pray for me? I, I know I have an idol or idols in my heart. Would you just pray for me? Just raise your hand and I'll just, I'll just pray for you. All right. Amen. All right, well, God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the holiness of him placed upon us and his righteousness. Thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing in closing.
with you all today, and uh, we're going to go to Sunday school now, and, and uh, may God bless you. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples that you've given to us throughout your word. You, you reveal everything. Uh, you're not biased, and you are honest, and you are good. And I thank you for allowing me to be called your son. And so, God, I just pray that you would equip not only me, but each and every one of us to look more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, day by day. That we would bring you glory, honor, and praise, Lord. That we'd be pleasing to you in the way that we live our lives inside and outside of this church. Inside and outside of our Christian relationships. God, that we would just... uh, represent you well. God, bring us back together soon. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great, great rest of the morning and afternoon.